Good morning and welcome to this time of worship. We are thankful for those who are gathered here, and we also welcome and are thankful for those who are worshiping with us on Channel 77 or online. Even though we cannot all be here together, we know that God is present not only here, but also in our homes. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 57. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praise to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens, your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's come together in prayer. The great God, we give you thanks this morning for the hope that we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We praise you for his presence with us in this place and in our homes. Because he lives, we look for eternal life, knowing that nothing past, present, or yet to come can separate us from your great love made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We continue to celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and won the victory over sin. Our opening song this morning is this joyful Easter tide. God greets us this morning with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This morning I read God's will for our lives from Deuteronomy chapter 5 as it is paraphrased in the message, I am God, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a house of slaves. No other gods, only me. No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything whatever, whether of things that fly or walk or swim. Don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, your God, and I am a jealous God. I hold parents responsible for any sins they pass on to their children to the third and yes, even to the fourth generation. But I'm lovingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. 
no using the name of God, your God, in curses or silly banter. God won't put up with irreverent use of his name. No working on the Sabbath. Keep it holy, just as God, your God, commanded you. Work six days, doing everything you have to do, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day, a rest day. No work, not you, your son, your daughter, your servant, your maid, your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, not even the foreign visitors from another town. That way, your servants and maids will get the same rest as you. Don't ever forget that you were slaves in Egypt, and God, your God, got you out of there in a powerful show of strength. That's why God, your God, commands you to observe the day of Sabbath rest. Respect your father and mother. God, your God, commands it. You'll have a long life. The land that God is giving you will treat you well. No murder, no adultery, no stealing, no lies about your neighbor, no coveting your neighbor's wife, and no lusting for his house, field, servant, maid, ox, or donkey either. Nothing that belongs to your neighbor. We're honest with ourselves. We know that we sin in our thoughts and in our words and in our deeds, and I invite you now to join me in a prayer of confession. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before you or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We confess that too often we've gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us, we pray. Raise us from our sin that we may be your faithful people obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. Hear these words of assurance of pardon from Romans chapter 8. You are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, then your body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. Let's sing together a hymn of response and assurance. You are my all in all. Before we go to prayer this morning, I want to mention a few things. First of all, Gary Rootman is scheduled for a CT scan on Tuesday in Omaha. Also, um, I need to tell you that he's been losing strength in the last while and is very weak, so we need to remember him. 
Diane Bonestro was transferred to Sanford Hospital in Sioux Falls on Friday. She had surgery on Saturday morning. We need to pray for her for a good recovery. Uh, we extend our Christian sympathy to Dory DeYoung and family in the unexpected passing of Dwayne DeYoung early Friday morning. Dwayne was also a brother-in-law to Glenda Ullman and to Donna and Rob Fetters and a nephew and cousins to others in the congregation. Visitation without family will be this afternoon from 3 to 7 p.m. at the funeral home. The funeral service will be tomorrow morning at 10 here at the church. The service will also be on channel 77 and live streamed. And the family asked me to mention this, since the DeYoung family cannot be present at the visitation due to social distancing, they are inviting you to drive by the DeYoung home at 1713 Willow Street today to wave or to say hi as the family will be out front. Also, we invite you to tune in again this evening for another opportunity to worship God. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord our God, we come to you this morning thanking you that we can come to you in prayer in a world that's filled with hurt and pain and challenges and uncertainty. We look to you as our rock, our strength, and our hope. We're so grateful to know that you rule and rain and nothing happens outside of your control. We thank you for your word, for in it we find the good news of the gospel. We find instruction as to how to live our lives. We find words that teach, rebuke, correct, and train in righteousness. We find wonderful promises from you that encourage us as we journey through life. Help us, we pray, to read your word, to love your word, and to live according to it. Lord, we know that Satan comes like a roaring lion. We know that he wants to deceive us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to pull us away from you. Help us, we pray, to live in the boundaries that you have laid out for us in your law. Help us to be obedient to you. Search our hearts, we pray, and show us any areas of our lives that need to be changed. We bring our needs before you this morning, Father. We look to you for comfort for Dory DeYoung and all who mourn the unexpected passing of Duane early Friday morning. Uphold this family as they mourn. We pray also for Matt and Kate Schultz and family and the passing of Matt's grandfather. We pray that you would comfort this family as well in their sorrow. We pray for those who struggle with health concerns. We pray for a good report for Gary Rootman as he goes for a CT scan. We also pray that you would encourage and strengthen and give him better health. We think of Diane Bonestro as she recovers from surgery. We pray for your healing mercies for her. We ask for a good report from the biopsy. We pray for Dory DeYoung who needs to have a kidney stone removed at some point in the future. We pray that it would go well and also that she would feel well until that procedure takes place. We ask for your continued healing for Dennis Cruzy, for Sandy Starkenberg, for Lois Salazar, for Jarvis DeWild. We lift up Roger Dykstra who's recovering from a brain bleed. We remember Jewel Hoffman as she has been diagnosed with cancer. We pray for your healing mercies. God, we pray for those who have other health concerns. There are other members in the congregation who struggle with health issues or family members who do. God, we pray for relief. We pray for those who have chronic pain. We remember, too, all those in the nursing home. For those who are confined to their own home, keep them in health, we pray. We also pray for the ongoing challenges in our lives and in this country with the coronavirus. We pray for healing for those who are sick, for comfort for those who've lost loved ones, for wisdom for our leaders. We pray for all those who've been affected economically. We remember those who have been laid off, for those who now work from home, for our children as they study online. God, this is a big adjustment and a challenge in so many ways. Help all of us to do the best we can with unusual circumstances. Help us to be responsible and take the precautions that we need to take. 
and help us to look to you because we know that there are many aspects of this that are beyond our control. God, we know that you want us to do our part, but we look to you for your help. We give you thanks for elders and deacons. We pray for wisdom as they are called to make decisions in difficult and unusual times. We're grateful for those who will be finishing their term soon. We're also thankful for those who are willing to serve. We pray for each person listening this morning. You know the difficulties and challenges that we all face. Encourage us, remind us that you are enough and that you will continue to walk with us and help us. God, we thank you for all of your blessings. We thank you for the springtime of this year. We ask for your blessing upon farmers as in this season of the year crops are planted. We pray for proper amounts of rain and sunshine. And for those in other occupations, we ask for your blessing as well. We pray for your blessing upon all of us in the work that you have called us to do. Bless and provide, we pray. And we also pray that you would provide the resources that are needed for this church to minister effectively in this place. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior and Lord's name. Amen. This is the time when the offering is usually taken. This morning the offering is for the building fund and the different methods of giving will be posted on the screen during the offering. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I hope you're all listening. I wish you could be up front here with me, but hopefully we'll be able to do that in the next while. But I'm thankful that you can listen on TV or online. And this morning, what I brought is a garbage bag. And in the garbage bag is a whole lot of shredded paper. And I want you to imagine that you were here with me, and it was a really windy day, 
and you know how days in Iowa can be windy. And we went outside, and I took this garbage bag, and I shook it all out, and the wind came, and the wind blew this shredded paper all over town, and the wind kept blowing, and it probably went out in the country. And after a while, I said to you, you know what, boys and girls? I want you to help me. We're going to go find all of these pieces that blew away. And we're going to collect them all, and we're going to put them back in the bag. And I know what you're thinking, Pastor Lauren, that's not possible. There is no way that we could ever get all of this shredded paper back. You know, boys and girls, what that reminds me of? It reminds me of our words. Once we speak our words, we can't take them back. Sometimes we might be tempted to say something to someone that's unkind and hurtful, and we say it, and we can apologize, which we should do, but it's like we can't take those words back. And sometimes people will say bad things about other people to other people, and those people in turn will tell other people, and those people will tell other people, and before you know it, a whole lot of people can know, the whole town can know, just like this shredded paper has blown all over town. And once that happens, the damage is done, we can't take the words back. And so we have to be very, very careful about the words that we speak. There's a Bible verse that says, He who holds his tongue is wise. The Bible also says that we should say things that encourage people and build them up. And so we need to remember that. We need to remember that the words we speak need to be words that God would have us to speak. Let's pray, and after that, we're going to sing the same song that we did last week. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. And this time, we got to pay a special attention to the words of the third verse. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the ability to speak and communicate and talk to people and tell people that we love them and that we care about them. But we also know, Lord, there is the temptation for us to speak words that are hurtful and words that are not helpful and words that we shouldn't talk about or share with others. Help us, Lord, to have a guard on our tongue. Thank you for your love and your care. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon each of the boys and girls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Would you please join me in prayer? 
God, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear your word and to obey your will. Give me the right words to speak, and we pray that you would keep distracting thoughts from us. And we pray that after hearing and listening to your word, that we would better be able to be your people in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 4 and one verse from Deuteronomy chapter 5, and we also look at Lord's Day 43. A minister was uh, planning to preach about lying to his congregation, and so he told the congregation, before next Sunday, I would like you to read Mark chapter 17 so that you will better understand my message. The following Sunday, the minister went up to the pulpit and he asked the congregation, how many of you have read Mark 17 this week as I asked? And nearly every hand went up. The minister smiled and said, Mark only has 16 chapters. And then he went on to say, now I will proceed with my sermon on the sin of lying. We continue this morning in our series on the Heidelberg Catechism. We're in the gratitude section looking at the Ten Commandments. This morning we look at the Ninth Commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Ephesians 4, beginning to read at verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no more, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. And also these words from Deuteronomy 5, verse 20, the ninth commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. God blesses the reading of his word. And then to Lord's Day 43 of the Heidelberg Catechism. What is God's will for you in the ninth commandment? God's will is that I never give false testimony against anyone, twist no one's words, not gossip or slander, not join in condemning anyone without a hearing or without a just cause. Rather, in court and everywhere else, I should avoid lying and deceit of every kind. These are devices the devil himself uses and they would call down on God's intense anger. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, and openly acknowledge it, and I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. Some years ago, Harrison Associates conducted a poll of 5,000 students between grades 4 and 12 with the following question. If one of your friends vandalized school property, would you lie to protect your friend? 53% of the students said they would lie to protect their friend even though their friend had broken the law. 
Another survey revealed that 66% of Americans say it's not wrong to tell lies. Only 31% of this agreed with the statement that honesty is the best policy. A Dr. Leonard Keeler, inventor of the lie detector machine, after having tested 25,000 individuals, came to the conclusion that human beings are basically deceptive. It's on Mount Sinai that God gave his people a blueprint for life. He gave them the Ten Commandments. And one of those commandments says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. In essence, God says, if we are going to have a legal system that works, if families and relationships and society are going to work the way they ought to work, we need to be truth tellers. We need to keep the commandment, you shall not give false testimony. Now, maybe when we hear that commandment, we don't think too much of it. That's not something we do. But listen to some of the ways that we can break this commandment. The first one is obvious, giving false testimony in court. This is a commandment that deals specifically with truth-telling in a court of law. We read God's word in Exodus 23, God's word to the children of Israel, do not spread false reports. Do not help a guilty person by being a malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. But God is terribly concerned that truth is spoken in a court of law. I read about a 12-year-old boy who was called to testify in a very important case. He was a very important witness in a lawsuit, and one of the lawyers who was cross-examining the boy said to him, your father has been telling you how to testify, hasn't he? And the boy answered the lawyer's question, yes, he has. The lawyer continued, now tell us what your father told you to do in terms of how to testify. And the boy said, well, my father told me the lawyers will try to tangle me in my testimony, but if I'm just careful and tell the truth, I will be able to tell the same thing every single time. It's a no-brainer that the truth needs to be told in a court of law. Because the court of law decides who is at fault in the death of an innocent person. The court of law decides what the penalty will be when the law is broken. The court of law determines if a person is innocent or guilty. All of these decisions are based on deciding who is telling the truth and who is lying. But telling the truth is a non-negotiable in a court of law. But it's not just lying in court that this commandment concerns itself with. The Catechism, if you remember, says that in court and everywhere else I should avoid lying. Young people, you need to remember that. That includes lying to parents. Parents, it includes lying to children. It includes lying in front of your children. Spouses, that includes you lying to your spouse. This commandment tells us not to lie to the people around us. The second form of giving false testimony is through distorting the truth. The Catechism says we are to twist no one's words. Many people don't tell bold-faced lies, but they twist the truth for their own purposes. And that happens all the time. The media is often guilty of this. People are misquoted. Their words are taken out of context. Their words are twisted to suggest a meaning other than what the person intended to convey. I remember writing a letter to the editor of the newspaper and the next day I was quoted. No, I was misquoted. Totally take it out of context. We can distort the truth by telling a partial lie. Reminded of a captain of a ship who was disciplined, who discipl a captain of a ship who disciplined a certain sailor because of 
infractions of regulations, the end result was that this particular sailor held a grudge against the captain. One day the captain was sick, that sailor was assigned to be in command on the watch on this particular ship. It was duty of the person in command to record the daily entry into the ship's log. And on this particular day, the sailor said, wrote the following, remember he had a grudge, the captain was sober today. Now on the one hand, that was true. He was sober on that particular day, but he was sober every day. He did not drink. However, noting that he was sober on that particular day was a selective truth. Sailor wrote that because he wanted to hurt the captain's reputation. Consequently, the truth was stated in such a way that it was a lie. That same kind of thing can happen when it comes to God's word. Paul warns the church in Galatia, evidently some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And Paul says, you're not just distorting my words, you're distorting God's words. And Paul spares no words when he says, if you distort the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are eternally condemned. Only one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ. And yet, in spite of what Paul says, that kind of discourse, distortion goes on every day. There are religious leaders who say there are more than one way to God. There are cults who have changed God's word, rewritten it, left out certain parts to advance their own purposes. Many people today find new ways to interpret Scripture in order to justify their behavior. Third way to break this commandment is through gossip or slander. And when it comes to gossip, we can do that in one of two ways. We can pass a rumor along that cannot be substantiated, or we can also pass along information when it's not necessary to do so. Ramona Kramer Tucker shares a true story in today's Christian woman. She said, while at a restaurant after lunch, my friend Michelle and her co-worker stopped in the restroom to fix their makeup. Before returning to their jobs, their small talk turned to a subject of a woman who drove them crazy in the office. And she said, my friend Michelle launched into a two-minute diatribe about their co-worker, Beth. And as Michelle prepared to reveal more information, the stall door opened, and out walked Beth, red-faced and angry. They stared at each other for a moment in embarrassed panic. Michelle knew that she couldn't take her words back. In that instance, their eyes met. That afternoon, Beth did not return to work. The next day, Michelle heard through the grapevine that Beth had resigned, and while some people cheered the good news, Michelle was deeply convicted. She was miserable. She wished she had talked to Beth instead of about Beth. Five years later, she still feels guilty. She's not forgotten. She's tried phone calls. She wrote a letter of apology. Beth never responded. She said, I learned my lesson the hard way about loose lips. And she said, the worst part of it is I'm a Christian, and as far as I know, Beth is not. Friends, maybe every time that we are tempted to gossip, we need to think about what would happen, how would we feel if the person we're talking about immediately appeared and we realized that they had heard everything that we had spoken. Or better yet, every time we're tempted to gossip, maybe we should pray that the Holy Spirit would bring to mind the words of Jesus, but I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. I think we all know that gossip can be an extra big temptation in a small town where everybody knows everybody. When we lived in Iowa 30 years ago, we were traveling one day and having little kids, you know, they always got to go to the bathroom and it's like, well, there's a courthouse. I bet they have one. So we went in the courthouse, found the bathroom, 
Right by the stairway on the wall, there was an embro uh, a needlepoint that had been framed with these words on it. Not much happens in a small town, but what you hear sure makes up for it. And on the one hand, that's humorous, and we chuckle about that. But on the other hand, we, think, we have to think about how much hurt and damage has been caused in people's lives in little towns and big towns and big cities, because it happens all over. Friends, we do not have to repeat everything we hear. In fact, we ought not to repeat everything that we hear. If people talk to us about others, there's a pretty good chance that they talk to others about us. Proverbs 2019 gives good advice. A gossip betrays a confidence, so avoid anyone who talks too much. And if gossip is sharing unsubstantiated or unnecessary information about others, then slander is spreading false rumors about others. It's assigning the worst possible motives to others' intentions. It's refusing to give other people the benefit of the doubt. It's assuming the worst about other people and telling others as if it were the facts. Friends, every time we gossip or slander, we need to remember the words of Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first to present his case seems right till another comes forward and questions him. In other words, there's two sides to every story. Gossip and slander is just one side of the story. How often aren't we tempted to make judgments about a situation or pass along information about a person when we really don't know all the facts? Catechism says that we are not to join in condemning others without a hearing or without a just cause. Friends, gossip is the exact opposite of what Lord's Day 43 calls us to do. I should love the truth, speak it candidly, openly acknowledge it, and I should do what I can to guard and advance my neighbor's good name. Apostle Paul is very direct. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. The second part of the sermon, I want to consider the reasons why lying is dangerous and wrong. Maybe we wonder sometime, what's the big deal about a little lie now and then? If it presents embarrassment or gets us out of a tight spot, what's wrong with the occasional white lie or shading the truth a little bit? Is it really that big a deal? Let me give you some things to think about. First of all, lying pushes us away from God. We look at Scripture and we see that God is a truth teller. We read in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Titus 1, verse 2 says that we serve a God who does not lie. Hebrews 6, verse 18 tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. The Bible tells us again and again that it is absolutely inconceivable for God to tell a lie because error and falsehood come from one who can never come from one who, by his very nature, is truth. The same thing is true about God's word. We read in John 17, verse 17, your word is truth. Whenever God speaks, he speaks truth, and whatever is in his word is true. There is no error, there is no falsification, there is no deceit that can ever possibly come from the word of God or the mouth of God. He is truthful, and the very idea of falsehood is utterly repulsive to a holy God. 
Satan, on the other hand, is a liar. We read in John 8 where Jesus is talking to the Jews and he says to them, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Friends, when we lie, we're not acting like God. We're acting like Satan. We're showing our allegiance to the wrong father. Proverbs 6 tells us there are seven things that the Lord hates. Two of those have to do with this commandment, a lying tongue and a false witness who pours out lies. And secondly, we need to note that lying separates us from each other. What's essential to society, to families, to marriages, to friendships, to people in the body of Christ, to relationships in general is trust. And when people lie to each other, that trust is broken. I've told you this story before, but I think it bears repeating. Dr. Laura Schlesinger in her book on the Ten Commandments tells of the time that she caught her six-year-old son telling a lie, and she had given him the standard lecture many times, so this time she decided she needed a different approach. She told him, for the next week, you will not know whether or not I am lying or telling the truth. Her son did not seem very bothered at first. The next day, in the morning, she's driving him to school, and she said, uh, we're going to stop for a treat after school on the way home. And so, of course, he remembered that, and he said, we're going to stop for a treat on the way home today. You promised me. And she looked at him, and she said, I lied. You can imagine her son's reaction. He cried. He yelled. He told her it was not nice, it was not fair, and after two days of sporadic lying, her son soon got the message. Pretty tough medicine, but it made the point. When the truth is not given in a relationship, the result is going to be disappointment and heartache and insecurity and lack of trust. Lying is wrong because it causes serious problems in our relationships. The third Lying is very destructive. One of the reasons for that is because lying often leads to more lying. What happens when we lie? We need other lies to cover up our lies. Lying, you see, doesn't just alienate us from God and from other people. It creates a problem in our hearts such that we think we have to lie to cover up our other lies, and ultimately it becomes very self-destructive. Suppose for a moment the person who does safety tests for automobile manufacturers knows that there's a safety problem, but he presents the results as though there's no problem at all. The results can be deadly. Suppose the person who does medical research falsifies the results of their tests. A few years ago, major university took back a PhD from a person in chemistry because they learned that when he was working on his PhD, he had falsified some of the data in his experiment. And even though it was a relatively modest experiment, they took his PhD away because the records were falsified. The school said that lying in science is unforgivable. How would you like to go to a doctor who cheated his way through med school? Telling the truth in the world of sports is also important. We need to have truthful stopwatches or there's no sport. We need to have truthful final judges or there's no game. There can be no steroids and athletes if they're going to compete in the Olympics because it's different standards, different kinds of conditioning. And what we really have here is a false witness. Athletics does not work in a rigged game or with a referee who is dishonest. If that's the case, there's no game. 
Telling the truth is also important in the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul is very clear. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And what Paul is saying is for the body of Christ to function well, we need to be truth tellers. We need to do that in order to work together harmoniously. How can the body of Christ operate if people can't trust their leaders, if children can't trust their Sunday school teachers, if fellow Christians can't trust each other? Ninth commandment tells us to put off falsehood. Don't lie in court, don't lie to each other, don't twist each other's words, don't gossip, don't slander. Speak the truth to guard and advance our neighbor's good. In other words, we are to live by the truth. And of course, that's God's will for our lives. And you know and I know that we can't come even close to keeping this commandment without the help of the Holy Spirit within us. Before any person can even begin to handle the truth properly and speak the truth properly, we need to make sure that we know the one who is truth, and that, of course, is Jesus. We all know how easy it is to deceive other people. One of the ways that Satan deceives people is to have people believe that they are pretty good people, when the fact of the matter is all people are moral failures. Truth that is declared by the Apostle Paul in Romans 3. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks after God. All have turned away, they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so for starters, we need to understand the truth about ourselves. We all fall short of God's standard of moral perfection. The second truth about ourselves is that someday we will have to give an account before a holy God. And all the things that we've tried to cover up will be seen for what they are. We give an account. And that's why we have to be sure that we have admitted our sinfulness, that we've trusted in Jesus as our Savior from sin, and we seek to live for him. We need to make sure that we get to know the one who is truth. And again, if we haven't done that, the father of lies will come to us and he'll say, you know what, you have plenty of time. Don't get worked up about that. You can do that when you're older. The Bible that speaks truth says, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is our only hope. And it's only when we know Jesus as the truth and God's spirit lives within us and we are members of his body, it's only then that we can, with God's help, truly seek to be the people that God wants us to be and that we can truly speak the truth in love and we can guard and promote our neighbor's good name. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would set a guard over our lips. We pray that you would keep our mouths from false testimony, from lies, from distortion, from gossip, and from slander. Help us, Lord, to speak the truth in love, to guard our neighbor's reputation, to promote their good name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's so a song of response. Let's sing together, O God, my faithful Father.
God hear God's blessing. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.